A day that began with a class field trip ended with a parent's worst nightmare. Family and friends worked with local police and the FBI in an urgent search for a missing daughter. An unlikely suspect eventually emerged in the girl's disappearance. Faced with conflicting testimony, the FBI would need to rely on forensic evidence to convict a predator. Parents of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez knew their daughter was no runaway. But that was all they knew. Something had happened to her, something terrible. When they failed to find Brittany in their quiet Illinois neighborhood, they called the police. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The FBI was soon brought in to grapple with conflicting witness reports, false leads, and a lack of clues. Agents wouldn't stop until they found Brittany and the truth. Chicago, Illinois and its surrounding suburbs are home to roughly 10 million residents of various backgrounds and income. People settled here to take advantage of Chicago's economic and cultural opportunities. Families from Chicago's nearby suburb of Elgin were no exception. At about 5 p.m. on May 8, 1997, Wendy Howlett returned to Elgin with her five-year-old son and her 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, after enjoying the day at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium. The mother of two had chaperoned her daughter's fifth grade class on a field trip to the famous institution. She was just all excited about her field trip to the Shedd Aquarium. And I had five of her girlfriends with me. They had a great time. They liked the sharks, the turtles. We had lunch outside, seen the boats, seen planes going by. Brittany just had a wonderful time. Brittany and her friends were eager to play outside on the first warm day of spring. The fifth grader was her mother's eldest from a previous marriage. While upstairs with her son, Wendy heard her daughter call up from the street. Brittany asked if she could go to a nearby park. I looked down the window and she was looking up and I said, no, you can't go, you know, because I thought she was maybe just going with one friend and she actually went with five and I'm like, okay, there's a group, you can go. Just be back by six o'clock. The park was only two blocks away. Her son was too young to go with them, so Wendy offered to take him to his Aunt Pam's new house for a short visit. Since Pam lived in the neighborhood, the walk would be brief. On the way out, Wendy left Brittany a note, then bumped into her downstairs neighbor. She told him that if he saw Brittany return before six o'clock, her daughter had two options, wait for her mother upstairs or come to her Aunt Pam's house alone. 45 minutes later, Wendy had returned from Pam's without seeing Brittany. She figured she was still at the park with her friends. Wendy fixed a quick meal for her son while she waited for her brother to pick her up for work. At about 20 after six, her husband, Scott Howlett, came home from his job. Scott would watch the kids when Wendy worked part-time in the evenings with her brother as a custodian. And he walked in and I said, well, I gotta go to work now. Brittany's at the park with her friends. And he looked at me and said, no, she's not. Her friends are outside. Wendy's heart sank. She went to the window to check with Brittany's friends. And they all looked up at me and said, she went on her bike to Aunt Pam's house to where you are. I said, well, I'm home. Have you seen her since? They're like, no. 
Brittany's friends said they'd returned from the park a little while ago. Wendy called her sister-in-law, Pam. Hey, Pam. You seen Brittany? No, no, I seen her in the park. About half an hour ago. But Brittany had not shown up yet. The family went off in search of her. It wasn't normal for Brittany not to call me. From like 6 to 6.30, I'd normally know where she's at. So that was unusual to begin with for my daughter not to be in contact with me. It also wasn't like Brittany to be out alone. In a few hours, it would be dark. My husband left to start searching on foot, thinking maybe she could have been at this park still on the way to Aunt Pam's or something. We didn't know. When we didn't find her by like eight o'clock, a mother's instinct, I knew there was a problem. Wendy called 911. Elgin patrol units were immediately dispatched. Sergeant Robert Beter of the Elgin Police Department was a detective at the time. He knew that when police respond quickly, they usually find the minor unharmed. Anytime we receive a phone call regarding a missing child, it's, we take it pretty seriously. Initially, we make contact with the people who call us. In every case, we normally search the residence, the person's residence, inside, uh, just in case, cover the bases in case the person is hiding under the bed or in the closet, and that's happened in the past. That wasn't the case with Brittany. Wendy told officers that her daughter was last seen wearing jeans, a blue T-shirt, yellow socks and white sneakers. Police had to consider the possibility that Brittany had simply run away. They started asking me about my daughter, and they're like, well, are you sure she's not at her friend's house? I said, the friends she would have been at, they're right there. Um, they started asking me, are you sure she didn't run away? Was she angry? Was she mad? I'm like, no, she was, we had an awesome day all day. She was with her friends. And it's not like my daughter not to notify me this long. Investigators next questioned the Howlett's downstairs neighbor. He said that Brittany and her friends came back from the park at about 5.50, 20 minutes before Wendy had returned from her sister-in-law Pam's house. The neighbor said he gave Brittany the message from her mother. She could wait upstairs or go to her Aunt Pam's alone. According to him, Brittany seemed excited about going to see her aunt. Five minutes later, the 23-year-old neighbor said he was inside his apartment when he heard Brittany struggling to drag her bicycle up the basement stairs. He went out to give the 11-year-old a hand with her bike. Once they were on the street, Brittany thanked him and rode off toward her Aunt Pam's house. The neighbor never saw her after that. As word of Brittany's disappearance spread, more police and family members continued to gather to help in the search. At around 9 o'clock, Wendy's younger brother, Eddie Milka, pulled up. Brittany's uncle was shocked by the news. He told his worried sisters that he had also seen Brittany outside the apartment at around 6 o'clock when he had stopped by to pick up Wendy for work. He'd gone to work alone when he learned Wendy wasn't home. Milka said he would go to search for his niece at the park. Investigators continued to question people who lived close by, hoping someone had seen something that could point them in the right direction. But no one else had seen the 11-year-old on her bike after she left her house. Neighbors were reporting no type of disturbance or any unusual activity in the neighborhood. It was a very nice day, kids out playing. Uh, there was just no signs of, of her being taken from the scene by force. Um, so we were, we were very concerned. The searchers fanned out in every possible direction the fifth grader could have wandered. They began in the park where Brittany and her friends had been playing. A helicopter joined overhead. 
Other volunteers searched dumpsters and alleys in the area. Brittany and her bicycle seemed to have disappeared without a trace. As the night wore on, the searchers straggled back, weary and discouraged. Wendy remained at home, hoping for news on her daughter's whereabouts. During that search, I wanted to go out and help search, and they advised me that I should stay home just in case she called, or maybe it could have been a ransom or whatever. So I stayed home as hard as it was, and no phone calls, no nothing. My husband, my mom, my sisters, they were all out searching here, going to parks. Um, they continue to search all night. Wendy did her best to remain composed. But after six hours of fruitless searching, the mother was distraught. She was very upset, uh, very emotional, uh, very concerned, just at wit's end, um, just didn't know where to turn. Uh, we tried to reassure that, you know, we're doing everything we can. Uh, we're not going to give up on this. We're going to keep going and going and going until we find her. Once again, investigators turned their attention to the interior of the building for clues. In the basement, they were surprised to find Brittany's bike. The chain was unsecured. It wasn't like Brittany to leave it unlocked. So, you heard it? You yeah. heard her bring the bike was Brittany's prized possession. The neighbor told police he never saw Brittany return after she rode off. Investigators believe that the bike must have been returned before 6.20 when Scott Howlett, Brittany's stepfather, came home from work. Hoping for a lead, several officers returned to the station to search the database. Illinois state law requires that all convicted child molesters register with the local police. Investigators sought past offenders whose records might point to a likely suspect. Obviously, your number one concern would be if there's anybody in the area that would be, that could be prone to this type of behavior, taking a, uh, a, a young child. So we, we naturally assume, let's cover the base with sex offenders. Yeah, I got, uh, they discovered that a registered sex offender was known to reside a few blocks away from the missing girl's apartment. Local officers knew the man was currently homeless and lived in his van. They also knew where he usually parked at night. If the missing girl was inside, investigators didn't want to provoke him to do anything desperate. Brittany was not there. Nothing inside indicated Brittany had ever been in the van. He claimed to have no knowledge of the missing girl and gave the detectives an account of his activities that day. His alibi checked out. No, thank you. Have a nice night. Officers re-interviewed family and friends in the slim hope that they might offer something new that could help. Wendy's parents, Brittany's maternal grandparents, lived a few miles away with their 20-year-old son, Eddie Milka. No one had seen Brittany since Eddie had at about 6 o'clock. The family believed Eddie was one of the last persons to see her. We wanted to find out further information that Brittany might have relayed to him that she was going somewhere, or maybe he dropped her somewhere or something, anything that he might have been able to tell us. Eddie Milka appeared tired, but detectives wanted to get a more detailed statement while his memory was still fresh. When police asked him to provide one back at the station, the missing girl's uncle was offended. He blurted out, why do you guys think I took Brittany? Um, we were kind of taken aback by that because it was an unusual statement. Um, it was, we weren't accusing him of anything, we were just asking for his help. Despite the offense and the late hour, Eddie agreed to talk to them at the station. Anything to help investigators locate Brittany. 
we'll have to take a look in the car. Sure. He also allowed police to search the car he'd been driving what, to quell what whatever doing? suspicions they may have had. In that type of a search, you'd take a look and see if anything would, would uh, draw your attention to the car. Maybe some item of clothing that she was wearing at the time. Not that we expected to find that in there, but um, we need to explore all avenues. There was a garbage can in the back seat of the car. Uh, there was a vacuum cleaner in the trunk of the car. And it didn't surprise us because Wendy had told us that that's what they do. Uh, she and Eddie clean places um, at night, generally. Eddie accompanied the police to the station. Detectives hoped he'd have the answers they needed to find his missing niece. Brittany Martinez was still out there, somewhere. And investigators didn't know if she was dead or alive. In the early morning hours of May 9, 1997, Wendy Howlett's 11-year-old daughter, Brittany Martinez, had been missing from her Elgin, Illinois home for almost 11 hours. Extensive searches and interviews through the night had turned up no trace of the missing girl. Desperate, Wendy Howlett reached out to the community for help. We called the Polyclass organization. They sent us information and what to do and what procedures to follow to get her picture on the internet for those missing and exploited children. We started calling any of the news channels to see if they can get her picture on TV to see if someone maybe seen her. If one news station said no, we called the next one. Chicago morning news programs broadcast appeals to the public to be on the lookout for the brown-haired 11-year-old. Authorities set up a hotline, hoping for the call that would lead them to Brittany. Like many in the community, Elgin Police Detective Robert Beter was deeply troubled by the case. This investigation was particularly difficult because of uh, it involved a small child. She was 11 years old, and actually at the time, my son, my oldest son, was 11 years old, and it kind of hit home. Um, when you first get these cases, 99 times out of 100, you can find the person rather quickly. So as time goes on, it just, it just became very draining um, to try, try to determine where this person's at. Okay, Eddie, tell me what happened that evening. Racing against time, detectives turned to Brittany's uncle, Eddie Milka, for help. Although the 20-year-old janitor had been up all night, detectives asked him to detail what he could remember about the last time he saw his niece. He said that at around 6 p.m., he arrived to pick up Brittany's mother, Wendy, who was supposed to help him clean a building that night. Eddie recalled seeing his niece outside with her bike. He asked where her mother was. Brittany said that her mother was not home. Eddie couldn't wait for his sister. He had to be at work, so he said goodbye, hugged his niece, then left at around 6.15. He said he wasn't sure if Brittany had taken her bike inside afterwards. At about 6.45, Eddie stopped at a convenience store to buy a pack of cigarettes before work. He stayed at work until 8.30 and discovered that Brittany was missing at about 9. He had searched two parks that night where he knew Brittany often played. But like the rest of the family, he turned up nothing. Afterwards, he stopped by the house of some friends and admitted smoking marijuana with them. Now he was exhausted and wanted to get some sleep. At some point in the interview, he said, listen, guys, you're just going to have to let me go because I don't have anything else to tell you. I'm tired. I want to go home. Um, and at this point, it was like a three-hour interview. And we didn't, have, we didn't have any reason to keep him there, so then we brought him home. With time working against him, Elgin police contacted the Chicago field office of the FBI. From experience, FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey knew that if Brittany was not found in the first 24 hours, the girl's chances of survival were slim. The initial hours are incredibly crucial. We all know in law enforcement and having worked previous kidnapping cases that the longer the child goes missing, the less likelihood there is of recovering the child, certainly alive. 
and our mission is to recover a live child. The FBI offered local authorities additional manpower, plus a computer system that helped organize cross-reference and manage leads. These resources became increasingly valuable as calls flooded in. There were hundreds of leads that were called in by the public because of a, a number that was disseminated to the public for anyone having information. All of those leads were cataloged and checked. People's alibis were checked. Investigators decided to follow up on Eddie Milka's alibi as well. They spoke to the president of the company whose building Eddie was scheduled to clean the night before. The executive had worked late that night and saw no one else in the building. When he locked up at 8.15, the president's car was the only one in the lot. Investigators also checked the convenience store where Milka said he bought cigarettes. The store was equipped with a 24-hour surveillance camera. The detective scanned the video recorded on May 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. He never saw Brittany's uncle enter the store. Eddie Milka had lied about his whereabouts. The other family members were interviewed, and what they told us turned out to be true. All their whereabouts were accounted for. Other people were, were able to verify their statements. Everything that Edward Milka told us turned out not to be true. But the discovery that Milka had lied did not prove wrongdoing, nor did it put investigators any closer to finding the young girl. It had been almost 24 hours since Brittany was reported missing. Investigators continued to pursue all viable leads. By this time, we were just getting continuous telephone leads, people, the citizens calling in, community calling in, assisting us with, with possible information. Maybe they saw her somewhere. Witnesses reported seeing Brittany in many locations throughout the region, including a restaurant. The police dispatched officers to check each sighting. The public and investigators alike clung to hope that Brittany was still alive. Each time officers responded, they were disappointed. Police found only conflicting stories and unconfirmed accounts. By the end of the first day, investigators were forced to consider the possibility that they were no longer looking for a live victim. May 10, 1997, marked the second day that Elgin, Illinois police and the FBI searched for missing 11-year-old Brittany Martinez. Since Brittany had now been missing for over 36 hours, the possibility that she had met a violent end became more likely. The last person to have seen her was her uncle, Eddie Milka. Elgin detective Robert Beter could not eliminate Milka as a suspect. Eddie Milka was always a question. It was always a question on his behavior. It was always a question on his statements that he told us. And all the other leads that we were getting in, they were quickly, quickly resolved. But no one had seen Milka talking to Brittany outside her home, as Milka himself had claimed. Thanks. Elgin police detective Brian Gorkowski realized that unless Brittany or her body was recovered, investigators had no physical evidence that she'd been harmed. We suspected that this was a kidnapping maybe at some point or a child abduction, but again, we had no tangible things to say, you know, this is a murder. We had no body. We had no smoking gun, if you will. That was very difficult for me. On the morning of May 10th, Detective Gorkowski received a page from Brittany's mother, Wendy. She said that her brother, Eddie Milka, wanted to talk to police again. We wanted to re-interview Eddie Milka. We wanted him to come in and talk to us voluntarily. And if he did do that, we wanted as much information about his background, his past, as we could gather. So we were very pleased that she did give us this background. Wendy Howlett described Eddie as slow. He had attended a special high school for the learning disabled. As far as she knew, Eddie had few friends and no girlfriends. Investigators met with the 20-year-old in the police department's family interview room. You all right? 
okay, yes. They asked him what he wanted to tell them. The detectives were pleased by Eddie Milka's response. Milka told us he had lied. I mean, initially, right off the bat in, in the beginning of this conversation, and that he was now going to tell us the truth. Well, at that point, I got a little excited because I like when someone I'm going to interview tells me they lied. Because that, at that point, I know that we can get everything behind us. We can start getting the truth out. We can be open. There can be some honest dialogue between the two of us. He admitted that when he saw Brittany, he was under the influence of marijuana. But he maintained that he had left his niece in front of her apartment at about 6.15 when he drove off to work. Milka told detectives that when he pulled into work, he saw his boss's car and wanted to avoid him since he was high. He claimed that he didn't enter the office building until 8.15 when his boss left. Detectives knew this version couldn't be true. We confronted him with the workplace lie. You weren't in the workplace at 8.15 p.m. We know that because the owner said there was no one inside that business when he had left. Milko told us, you know, you, you might be right. Um, there may be some time difference here. But Milka didn't elaborate. If he knew where Brittany was, he wasn't forthcoming. Investigators tried a new tack. I asked him to imagine where Brittany was at this point in time because he was the last one to see her. He began to rub his temples, he closed his eyes, and then he said she was in Elgin, then she was near Elgin, that she was cold and wet. He continued to reiterate that constantly. We asked if she was breathing, he said that she was not. We asked if she was bleeding. He told us, no, she wasn't bleeding. Milka asked for a cigarette. I just, I know she's dead. And I he started pacing and mumbling, then asked the detective to write down what he was about to say. Milka claimed he was having a vision of Brittany in an old gray car with two men who were drinking beer. He also saw farmhouses, a dirt road, gravel, rocks, and a creek. He added that the men had touched her all over, but he didn't stop there. After he had told me that he had seen these two uh, males touching Brittany, he then told me, I know she's dead, I want to tell my sister she's dead, grabbed me, hugged me, and began to cry. Wendy Howlett was called down to the station. She noticed her brother had been crying and asked what he had to tell her. Once again, Eddie Milka changed his story. He just looked up at me and said, I didn't do it. I don't, you know, they're putting things in my head. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. They're telling me Brittany's dead. Brittany's still alive. We got to find her. Since Milka never admitted any wrongdoing in his vision statement, police had nothing to hold him on. Wendy took her brother home. Investigators questioned the two friends Milka said he had smoked marijuana with on the day Brittany disappeared. They confirmed that they'd been with Eddie until 10 minutes to six when he left for work. Milka told them that he would be back later to watch the Bulls game. When he returned at approximately 10.30 that night, Milka was upset and crying. He told them that his niece, Brittany, was missing. They then drank a few beers and watched the rest of the Bulls game. Eddie left their house at about 1 a.m. The friends had nothing more to add. Investigators still had no evidence that Milka had abducted Brittany and no clue as to where she might be now. And then, you know, a week goes by and we still haven't determined what happened to her. She could have been fined somewhere. She could have been taken and then released. And that's how some of these cases work out. Some of the more, uh, the more dangerous ones, the person takes them and then releases them at a later time. 
On May 17, 1997, nine days after Brittany disappeared, a couple was boating on the Kishwaukee River, 18 miles outside of Elgin, when they made a grisly discovery. They found the body of a girl washed up on a sandbar. She was naked from the waist up and severely decomposed. The terrified couple made for shore and then ran to call the police. On May 17, 1997, nine days after 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was reported missing from her Elgin, Illinois home, a young girl's body was discovered 18 miles away in the Kishwaukee River. Lieutenant Jean Lowry of the McHenry County Sheriff's Department investigated. At the time, we weren't sure if it was Brittany Martinez or not. I knew from screening the missing cases that come through our jurisdiction at the Sheriff's Department, we didn't have any missing females that would be within that age range. So we begin to look outside of our jurisdiction and other, other police agencies to determine what, if any, missing persons might fit that description. Um, the nearby Elgin police and FBI were called in to determine if the dead girl was Brittany. FBI Special Agent Beth Malarkey believed they had finally found her. Those of us who were involved in the investigation and knew the description of Brittany, what she looked like, what her hair looked like, the clothes that she was wearing when she was missing, although the body that was found on the sandbar was missing a t-shirt, the rest of it very much resembled Brittany Martinez, the dark hair, the blue jeans, the socks, and the tennis shoes that she was wearing. It was impossible to visually identify the victim or to immediately determine how she had died. Investigators could see no external wounds. They believed she had likely been killed elsewhere than dumped in the river. The mood amongst the investigators was grim. It just became very sad because the reality of having a dead child and the, investigating, the investigation changing from a missing child to possibly a murdered child um, changed the whole tone of the investigation. The surrounding area struck Detective Brian Gorkowski as similar to the place Eddie Milka had described earlier in his vision statement. The scene of the Kishwaukee River at that point seems more like a creek or a small body of water, not necessarily what you would picture a river to be. There were rocks, there was dirt roads in the area, there was farmhouses. The landscape very much uh, depicted what Eddie had told me in the vision statement. To confirm that Milka's vision statement was not a coincidence, they needed proof that could link him to this location. The FBI's evidence recovery team, specialists in crime scene forensics, were called in. It was the same unit that sifted through the debris of Pan Am Flight 103 and the Oklahoma City bombing. The ERT is very highly trained and professional and organized in how they conduct crime scene searches. And because this looked like a murder investigation at this point, every piece of evidence was going to be extremely important. The forensic technicians took soil, water, and plant samples as well as samples of the insects that had colonized the body. Based on the development of these larvae, scientists determined that the victim died no later than 2 p.m. on May 9th, the day after Brittany disappeared. That night, Wendy Howlett prayed it wasn't Brittany. I still was trying to keep hope that it wasn't my daughter and I was hoping it was no one else. It was someone's little girl, but I was hoping it wasn't mine. Two days later, dental records confirmed that the remains were, in fact, those of Brittany Martinez. A forensic pathologist determined that she had died of asphyxiation. Two strips of tape were removed from her face and mouth. A large bruise with scalloped edges was found on her cheek. To investigators, it resembled a bite mark. 
The examiner noted that Whitney's jeans were only half zipped and her underwear was on inside out. He found two lacerations on the hymen. The pathologist concluded that the fifth grader had been sexually assaulted immediately before or at the time of her death. It would take several more months to process Brittany's clothing and tissue samples at the FBI lab. Special Agent Malarkey wanted to make sure that the analysis was thorough. I have to say that I didn't sleep for several days after that because seeing her, seeing the state that she was in, and understanding the magnitude of what took place. Detective Robert Beter hoped the discovery of Brittany's body and clothing would provide the physical evidence they needed to catch her killer. When it was final, at that point we could notify the families and, and really start digging our heels and focusing on uh, some of the evidence we had already recovered. For the past 11 days, Wendy Howlett had nourished the hope that her child was still alive. Now, that hope was dashed. The Howlett's worst fears had come true. When they told me that it was my daughter, it is the worst feeling that you ever want to know. I can't even describe the pain that it goes through because that was my only girl. And I wish this upon no one, not even my worst enemy do I wish this upon. And like an hour after my daughter, they confirmed that it was her, I went into her room and started breaking things. And then I got even more upset because I was breaking her things and I still was hoping she was alive even though I knew she wasn't. Investigators speculated on why Brittany's body had come to rest in a river 18 miles from her home. Lieutenant Jean Lowry asked Brittany's mother if the location seemed significant. And at that time, she had indicated that her father was an employee of the Milwaukee Railroad and had since been retired or disabled, and the family spent many summers at the Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois, a very, very short distance from where Brittany Martinez's body was found. Eddie Milka had spent time there as well. Investigators secured a warrant for samples of his blood, saliva, and hair. They were forwarded to the FBI lab so examiners could begin the lengthy work of DNA mapping. Milka's genetic profile would be ready for comparison to any foreign DNA recovered from Brittany or her clothing. A forensic dentist also took impressions of Milka's teeth. Investigators suspected the mold would match the bite mark found on Brittany's cheek. The dentist compared the cast to a blown up photo of the indentations on the victim's face. The two appeared to match. But due to advanced decomposition, the bite mark was distorted, so the dentist could not be absolutely certain Milka's teeth had made the mark. The results were inconclusive. Authorities still lacked the physical evidence needed to make an arrest. They obtained a warrant to search the impounded Lincoln Town car they believed Milka had used to drive Brittany to the river. Soil samples collected from the wheel wells were found to be too common to prove where the car had been. Investigators hoped something on the inside would be more promising. Among the clutter in the back seat, agents found a paper cup from a fast food restaurant. Its lid was stained red with what appeared to be blood. The lid also held a partial palm print that matched Eddie Milka's. Brittany's fingerprint, along with her mother's, were found as well. Matted in the fibers of the backseat floor mat, they found more red stains. Agents secured samples of fibers from the floor mat and upholstery. More than 140 items were collected from the car and forwarded to the growing caseload at the FBI lab. 
Since the lab would take months to complete tests, Lieutenant Lowry asked Brittany's relatives to recall if anyone had been injured inside the car. Brittany's maternal grandmother, Milka, remembered that the 11-year-old had had a nosebleed in the car on the day of a family outing. Brittany's other grandmother said she was also there that day, but did not recall the incident. The Milka family painted it as, yes, there was a bloody nose in the vehicle, and these circumstances occurred. The other side of the family painted a dramatically different picture, that there was absolutely no evidence of a bloody nose. Family members on the two sides were lining up against each other. The Milkers believed that Eddie could not have killed Brittany. The hardest part of this investigation is the fact that our suspect was a family member. That obviously causes family problems when you suspect another family member of being the suspect in a case. That became difficult to overcome because we wanted the family's cooperation and it's difficult for the family to keep cooperating when one of their own becomes a suspect. Though circumstantial evidence pointed to Eddie Milka, contradictory stories and no confirmed physical evidence meant that investigators might never be able to charge Brittany's uncle with her murder. By early December 1997, Six and a half months had passed since the body of 11-year-old Brittany Martinez was discovered in a river 18 miles from her home. Her uncle, 20-year-old Eddie Milka, was the prime suspect and agreed to provide tissue samples, though his side of the family believed he was not responsible. Without substantial physical evidence, it would be difficult for the FBI and local investigators to charge him with murder. Examiners at the FBI crime lab in Washington, D.C. had spent months sifting through hundreds of pieces of trace evidence collected during the investigation. Karen Lanning, a scientist in the FBI's trace evidence unit, received Brittany's clothing and coordinated the examination. The evidence was processed in one of our scraping rooms, which is a room where we put the ev items of evidence, victims and suspects are kept separately, items from a scene are in a separate room so that we're not contaminating anything. Lanning examined Brittany's socks, underwear, and jeans. Each item was scraped in the search for hairs or fibers foreign to the clothing. On the inside of the jeans, the examiner discovered one thin nylon fiber, a fiber distinctly different from the denim. She would compare the questioned fiber to a known sample from the carpet in Milka's car. The fibers matched. In four additional tests, her results were the same. Investigators theorized that Brittany had been in Milka's car with her jeans removed since the carpet fiber was found inside of her jeans. But the fiber match alone was not enough to prove the theory since that type of fiber was common to many cars. I couldn't say the fiber came from that carpeting as opposed to another carpeting just like it. So if there were two cars um, that were the same, I can't say it's from car A versus car B. Investigators hoped the remaining evidence would prove more conclusive. Special Agent Melissa Smurf, okay. chief of the mitochondrial okay. DNA unit two at the FBI laboratory, okay. was a serology and nuclear DNA examiner at the time. It was her task to determine if any of the victims or suspects' fluids were present on the evidence. She found Brittany's clothing okay. too contaminated Thanks to test. Lot. Brittany had been dead for approximately nine days before she was found. Because of that, she had started to decompose, and the clothing that she had on her showed evidence of that decomposition. Agent Smurz instead focused on the red stains found on the fast food cup and carpet taken from Milka's car. She determined that the stains were human blood. Through DNA testing, she'd find out whose. 
The examiner compared known samples of Eddie Milka's and Brittany's DNA to that found on the cup and carpet. Agent Smurz concluded that the blood in the car had come from Brittany. The probability that someone else had bled on the cup was at least 6.4 million to one. It was enough to issue a warrant for Eddie Milka's arrest. On December 18, 1997, over seven months after Brittany disappeared, Eddie Milka was charged with murder, aggravated kidnapping, and predatory criminal assault of a child. His arrest took his sister, Wendy Howlett, by surprise. I not only lost my daughter, I am now losing my brother to something I know he didn't do. And I was more stunned and in shock than anything that, you know, this can't be happening. This, this nightmare has got to end somewhere. In order to protect her brother, Wendy Howlett said that it was unlikely that Eddie would have driven to the river in McHenry County since he had never been there before. She told Lieutenant Jean Lowry that the railroad museum the Milkas went to as kids was not in that area as she had previously stated. Wendy began to change her story for whatever reason and backed off on that statement that again forced us to re-interview her and try and determine you know where she was in regard to that statement because it it would be key in determining what the connection was to McHenry County. James McAuliffe of the McHenry County State's Attorney's Office knew the trial would be difficult. Two of the key witnesses, Eddie's sister Wendy and Eddie's mother, would testify on the suspect's behalf. I have those expert reports. We had to impeach some very sympathetic people for whom our hearts went out, but we had no alternative because they had changed their story so much. So we had to, in effect, attack our own witnesses and members of the family who had suffered such a terrible loss. It made it extremely difficult for us. It made it extremely difficult for the Milka and Hallett family and all the members who testified. On April 21st, 2000, nearly three years after Brittany's death, the case of the state versus Edward Milka went to trial. The prosecution called more than 50 witnesses. In closing arguments, prosecutors told the jury how they believed the murder had taken place. They believed Eddie Milka had helped Brittany return her bike to the basement. In her haste, she left it unlocked, but took the cup she'd carried since coming home from her field trip. In the past, Brittany had sometimes accompanied her mother and uncle on cleaning jobs to help pay for the bike she loved so much. The prosecution believed Eddie drove to a nearby forest preserve after he saw his boss's car parked at work. There, prosecutors contended, he sexually assaulted his niece and likely smothered her until she died, then dumped her body in the Kishwaukee River. The defendant, Edward Milka. The jury was not convinced Eddie Milka had planned to kill Brittany. When the jury retired and they came back, they entered a finding of not guilty on the first degree murder. They felt that he had not intentionally murdered his niece. Felony murder. On the second charge of murder while in commission of a felony sexual assault, the jury found Edward Milka guilty. Many investigators, including Lieutenant Lowry, sympathized with Wendy Howlett's loss. The verdict provided little comfort to her family. This is a tragedy, a human tragedy. There's no other way to cut it. As a father, I can tell you, if I had to experience this, I don't know if I could survive it. So for her as a mother, my heart goes out to her. Edward Milka was sentenced to 75 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. His crime tore a close family apart. When young Brittany was killed, no one could hear her scream. But with the FBI's forensic experts on the trail, the story of Brittany's final hours could be told. And her killer brought to justice. In the summer of 1988, a wealthy Jackson, Mississippi woman disappeared from her home in broad daylight. 
The only clue left behind was a mysterious ransom note. The FBI and local police struggled to find answers in its cryptic message so they could find the kidnapper and retrieve the victim before her time ran out. A daring kidnapping and a bizarre ransom note baffled Mississippi authorities. The victim was the wife of a wealthy businessman. A list of 12 names and a few drops of blood were the only clues to her fate. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The ransom note gave the FBI its first leads, but the case was not so clear cut. Solving it required the keen insight of a criminal profiler, and the perseverance of a family, local authorities, and the FBI. Six AM, July 26, nineteen eighty eight. The heat of a midsummer day would soon bear down on the southern city of Jackson, Mississippi. Like every weekday for the past 48 years, Annie Laurie Heron had coffee with her husband Robert before he left for work. As early investors in oil, the Herons had become one of Mississippi's wealthiest couples, with a fortune estimated at more than $100 million. That day, Annie Laurie Heron would host her bridge club at home the same house where she raised two children and lived with her husband since they were newlyweds. By 3.30, Mrs. Heron's bridge game was over and her friends had left. The housekeeper finished cleaning up after the card game and checked if Mrs. Heron needed anything else. The 73-year-old woman said everything was fine. Annie Heron planned to spend the rest of her afternoon reading until her husband returned. She wasn't expecting anyone, but perhaps one of the bridge players or the housekeeper had forgotten something. Her husband wasn't due home for an hour. Hi, how are you, ma'am? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. You got to see your husband. I have a letter. I'm about to see him. Not on my way at all. Let me Annie Laurie Heron was on her own. At about 4.30 that afternoon, Robert Heron returned from work. Annie, I'm home. He saw that his wife wasn't home and figured she was out with her friends or daughter. When she hadn't returned by 5.30, he thought it was strange that his wife of 48 years hadn't called or left a note. House seemed to be empty. Annie. Robert grew concerned and began calling family and friends. Uh, anywhere that I can tell. No one had seen no, Annie since the bridge game. The maybe, uh, maybe we're going to have to do something else. Thank you. Robert's son-in-law, who lived nearby, said he would be right over. The son-in-law said he and his wife hadn't heard from Mrs. Heron that day. Robert Heron pointed out that when Annie left the house, she usually took her purse. But his wife's purse and shoes sat beside her reading chair. Her newspaper and glasses were nearby. You know, we're just... I, I, I just don't know what to say. Robert well, was worried since Mrs. Heron's medicine for a chronic intestinal disease was still in the bathroom. She would need to take it soon or she would not be able to absorb food. The men continued to search for some indication of where she'd gone. 
A piece of paper near the front door caught the son-in-law's eye. Where's the view? It was a ransom note without specific instructions. It's a ransom. Annie it's Laurie Heron had I, been I, kidnapped. We, we've got to do something real fast. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 separate men before 10 days passed. But it didn't say how much or where to send the money. He was ordered not to call police, so he waited for a ransom call with instructions on getting his wife back. When none came by nightfall, he contacted the Jackson Police Department despite being warned not to. Officers secured the ransom note, hoping to keep any fingerprints intact. Processing the house for evidence, officers discovered a trace of what appeared to be blood on the front door frame. Laboratory tests would later reveal that it was blood and that it matched Mrs. Heron's blood type. A Jackson police detective interviewed Robert Heron. They wanted to know if he or his wife had ever been threatened. He had no idea who would want to harm them. If Mrs. Heron were without her medication for long, her intestinal condition would become critical. Kidnapping is a crime that must be solved quickly, or the chances of rescuing the victim are slim. That evening, Jackson police contacted Special Agent Patrick McGlennon of the FBI's Jackson Field Office to bring the resources of the federal government to bear right away. Under the federal kidnapping statute, the FBI has jurisdiction whenever an individual is, uh, is kidnapped in the United States. Uh, the presumption in this case, of course, was uh, a kidnapping had occurred, a ransom demand had been made, and uh, the possibility of travel interstate is, in fact, why the FBI gets involved in these types of matters. The FBI called U.S. Attorney James Tucker, who would advise investigators in legal matters as the case developed. Like most residents of Jackson, Tucker had great admiration for the Herons. Robert Heron was a self-made man, and uh, at the time of this incident, which was uh, 1988, uh, Mr. Heron was probably considered one of the m foremost uh, financial wizards uh, uh, here in the Jackson area. Uh, he was well known in, in the business community. Uh, he was uh, uh, a generous person, so he was becoming uh, well known for his particular acts of generosity. By dawn the next day, FBI agents and evidence technicians arrived at the Herons' home. The Jackson police detective filled in the case agent on what they'd learned so far. The FBI set up a satellite command post at the residence and tapped the Herons' phone, ready to trace any ransom calls. There was little doubt that multi-millionaire Robert Heron was the real target. Yet Mr. Heron hadn't been told what to pay to get his wife back. It was impossible to comply, or nearly impossible to comply, with the demands because they were nonspecific in nature. Mrs. Heron was not even mentioned in the note. There was no provision for her safe return. The note did say that the 12 men listed had been involved in the same photography company. Robert Heron explained that he had once served as chairman of the board for that company. Some of the company's franchisees had been sued to recoup losses, but Heron did not know which ones. It seemed unlikely that the 12 men named had kidnapped Mrs. Heron, but perhaps one or more of them was striking back at the company through Robert Heron. Technicians collected samples of all the writing pads and paper in the Heron's home. They would compare the paper to the ransom note to see if it had been written on the stock from the house. The results would take a few days. Investigators searched outside the house for hairs, blood, clothing, 
anything that might reveal the kidnapper's identity. They looked for cigarette butts or evidence of food or drink, signs that someone had been watching the house. They found nothing. And yesterday afternoon, Neighbors and domestic workers reported seeing nothing strange at the house the previous afternoon, and no one had seen Mrs. Heron leave. The next day, agents continued canvassing the Heron's neighborhood. Dr. Posey? They questioned a doctor who lived down the street. He said that he had seen something in the neighborhood recently that might be related to the kidnapping. Two weeks earlier, the doctor was going to run errands when he drove past a white van parked near his house. From that position, anyone in the van would have a clear view of the Heron house. Hey, well, here? Yeah, about 50 At first, the doctor thought nothing of it. But when he'd returned home hours later, the van was still there. Thinking the driver needed help, the doctor offered his assistance. Can I help you with anything? I wonder if you need some help. The driver responded by asking if there was a law against parking in the neighborhood. It was an odd response, enough to make the doctor remember the incident. He said the van drove away minutes later. Agents continued to canvass the Heron's neighborhood and found another neighbor who had seen a white van on the street three months earlier. The other neighbor had seen a van similar to the, that described by the first individual sitting almost directly in front of the Heron residence in the very earliest days of April of 1988. Uh, she was suspicious enough of the van to get the license plate number. If investigators could find that van, they might also find Mrs. Heron. But a computer check revealed that the license plate had been stolen from a car at the New Orleans airport. It was another dead end. After 36 hours of investigation and no ransom calls, agents hoped lab results on the note would provide a fresh lead to Mrs. Heron or her abductor. FBI examiners first determined that the note had been typed on paper foreign to the Heron's home. They also compared the typeface to known samples from every typewriter made in this century. The laboratory division was able to determine that the demand letter was in fact typed by a royal typewriter manufactured between 1912 and 1927. There was nothing else contained on the demand letter which would give analysts any type of ability to tell us the manufacturer of the paper or whether there were any indented writing or other evidence on the letter. A latent fingerprint examination revealed nothing, and a spot on the note believed to be a bloodstain was too small to analyze. Although no evidence on the note helped agents, they hoped its message would. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 men who were involved with a photography company. Perhaps the kidnapper was among them. Agents learned that the company had foreclosed on each of the 12 men, all former franchisees, to collect heavy debts. One of the company's executives provided the FBI with company files and photos of those men. One was now deceased. The others were scattered throughout the country. At the FBI's Jackson Field Office, agents split up the 11 names and began to review the files and photographs. They sent leads to FBI offices in the towns and cities where the men currently lived, requesting additional information. Agents found that many had financial troubles. They tried to ascertain if those men had traveled near the Heron neighborhood when the white van was spotted there and again recently when the kidnapping occurred. FBI agents across the country began covert surveillance on the former franchisees. They hoped one of the men would lead them to the 80, 73-year-old woman. 
But as the kidnapping investigation stretched into its third day, only seven days remained on the ransom note deadline, and agents still lacked instructions on how to recover oh, yeah. Annie Laurie Heron uh -huh. alive. Hi, how are you, ma'am? Three days had passed Good. since Annie Laurie Heron, an elderly grandmother, had been abducted from her Jackson, Mississippi home in broad daylight. The FBI continued surveillance on 11 men named in the ransom note found inside the Herons' home. Agents couldn't confront the men. A frightened kidnapper might harm the victim. Special Agent Patrick McGlennon hoped one of them would lead to the missing woman. We wanted to determine if they were traveling even small distances from their residences or business. Uh, we wanted to see if they perhaps were keeping Mrs. Heron at a uh, remote location where they might have to provide food, water, other conveniences for her, that they wouldn't want to be too far away from the victim. Despite the efforts of dozens of agents around the country, they discovered no direct leads to Mrs. Heron's whereabouts. But they still resisted contacting the 11 men directly so as not to reveal the investigation. The FBI considered the possibility that the kidnapper might be someone other than the men listed on the note. Agents contacted the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia for assistance. Profilers in the unit are agents trained to determine characteristics of criminals from the details of a case. One profiler reviewed the evidence, particularly the ransom note, looking for indications of the kidnapper's psychological makeup. The profiler called in his findings to the Jackson FBI agents working the Heron kidnapping. You mind if I put you on speaking fence so we can all listen at one time? In the conference call, the profiler confirmed that the kidnapper was likely one of the 11 suspects currently under surveillance. And since all those men had at least some college education, he believed one of them had intentionally misspelled words and used an old typewriter to throw off investigators. The profiler said the abduction was an act of revenge against Robert Heron by a paranoid individual who was willing to kill. The Behavioral Science Unit believed that a sole perpetrator was responsible for this crime, that it would be a white male of approximate middle age, and that the individual would probably be working alone, although if they were working in concert with someone else, that person would, would provide a very subordinate role. It's bad. The profiler also concluded that by this time, there was only a 50% chance that Annie Heron was still alive. One further detail caught the profiler's eye, a phrase that did not seem to match the rest of the note and might point to the profession of the kidnapper. The note said, pay them whatever damages are owed to them. If any is dead, pay their children. Damages was a, is, a, is a legal term. It was telling in that one of the individuals on that demand note was an attorney. Special Agent Tom Montgomery of the FBI's Jacksonville, Florida office was called in to investigate the attorney listed on the note, a man named N. Alfred Wynn. After we received the name of N. Alfred Wynn, we did the public record background checks. Uh, we also contacted the St. Petersburg Police Department of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, found that he had no criminal record, did our own computer checks also. Uh, we determined that he was a St. Petersburg attorney and that he lived above his office. Yeah. What's this all about? Well, I'm investigating a crime. An agent went to interview Wynn at his office residence. So, Mr. Wynn, uh, you were camping with the girl. Alfred Wynn said he had nothing to do with the kidnapping and explained where he was on July 26th, the day Mrs. Heron went missing. He had been at a bar with a prostitute. He said that on that evening, he had called his paralegal back at the office. He asked the employee to meet him at the bar to lend him $100 so he could go home with the prostitute. The paralegal promised to be right over. Hey. 
Wynn said he and the prostitute went outside. He stalled for time as he waited for his paralegal to show up with the money. The two were in Wynn's car when his assistant arrived. Wynn took the money, then left with the prostitute. Wynn said he didn't remember much about the evening. He didn't know the name of the bar or the prostitute's real name. The next day, Agents checked the alibi with Wynn's paralegal when the attorney was out of the office. He corroborated his boss's story and also claimed that he didn't know the bar's name since he had never been there before or since. Agents suspected both men were lying. We learned that Wynn had paid for the paralegal schooling at a local community college, uh, his paralegal schooling, we had learned that uh, he was working for basically a very uh, minimum salary, and there was a lot of allegiance between the paralegal and, and Mr. Wynn. Um, Later, an agent re-interviewed Wynn's paralegal, explaining their suspicions. He maintained that he had met Wynn at the bar on the same day of the kidnapping, though he did reveal something new about his boss. He said that Wynn's legal battle with the photography company had begun when the company foreclosed on him seven years earlier, and that he had fought the lawsuit with a vengeance. He had attempted to declare bankruptcy three times in order to avoid paying his debts. Under a court order to recover the money, the U.S. Marshal's Office had confiscated Wynn's valuables, including 1,000 shares of expensive stock. They also impounded Wynn's European sports coupe, a car the paralegal said Wynn loved. In addition, they put his St. Petersburg office up for auction. On July 6, 1988, less than three weeks before Mrs. Heron disappeared, Wynn had been notified of an eviction hearing. But he had refused to leave. The paralegal said that Wynn had been furious, okay, believing that the photography that. company had ruined you, uh, his life. Going to get that date for me. You're going to check that date. The FBI wondered if the paralegal had been involved in the kidnapping. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. We pulled all vehicles registered to the paralegal, friends and associates of Mr. Wynn, to include Mr. Wynn, and learned that the paralegal had a white van registered to him, and through an interview of the paralegal, learned that the vehicle was utilized by Wynn on several occasions. It seemed to be a major breakthrough in the case. The vehicle identification number revealed the name of the previous owner. An agent went to interview her. She said Alfred Wynn, not his paralegal, had been the actual buyer. She said that Wynn had acted strangely. He was adamant that his name not be written on the title. So the woman left the line for the buyer's name blank. The lead was promising, but then agents learned that the van had been in the repair shop on the day of the kidnapping. Okay, the, uh, okay how long was he gone? It was one more frustration in a difficult case. After more than a week, the FBI and U.S. Attorney James Tucker were no closer to finding Mrs. Heron. A case like this is extremely difficult when you don't have an eyewitness to any one of several situations. We did not have an eyewitness as to the abduction itself. We did not have an eyewitness that, that Newton, Alfred Wynn, or any of the other people listed in the particular note had ever been in Mrs. Heron's company. At the Jackson, Mississippi police station, investigators again met with the doctor who had seen a white van in the Heron's neighborhood. 
They hoped he could recognize the driver in a photo lineup. The neighbor quickly picked out the photo of Alfred sure. Wynn. He was certain it was Wynn he saw reading a map in a white van across the street from his house in mid-July, less than two weeks before Mrs. Heron's abduction. The other neighbor, who had seen a similar van, also identified Wynn as the driver. It was clear to agents that Alfred Wynn was connected to the kidnapping of Annie Laurie Heron, yet they didn't know how. We thought, because of the positive identification, that Wynn was definitely somehow involved in the kidnapping. If not the actual perpetrator, if not the man who walked up to the door and actually grabbed Mrs. Heron, he certainly was directing or calling the shots. Yep. FBI yeah. agents kept Wynn under surveillance. They believed that he could lead them to the missing woman. But as the deadline in the ransom note approached, hopes of finding the frail Mrs. Heron dimmed further. The day after the deadline in a ransom note, FBI agents and local detectives briefed the husband of kidnapped Jackson, Mississippi socialite Annie Laurie Heron in preparation for a televised appeal for his ailing wife's return. Okay, we'll do it. Thank you. The note hadn't outlined specific steps to earn Mrs. Heron's release. FBI behavioral profilers hoped the press conference would prompt the kidnapper to contact Mr. Heron with instructions to get his wife back unharmed. With his son and daughter at his side, Robert Heron asked anyone with any information to come forward. As a businessman. He also spoke directly to the kidnapper, promising to follow any specific instructions. A week later, the plan seemed to have worked. On August 15, 1988, Robert Heron spotted the familiar handwriting of his wife among his mail. The envelope was postmarked August 12th from Atlanta, Georgia. Investigators were careful not to destroy any evidence that might have been left on it. Mr. Heron believed the letter was in his wife's handwriting, too. FBI lab examiners later confirmed that it was. In the letter, Mrs. Heron begged her husband to do what the kidnappers wanted, or they would seal her up in a cellar with only a few jugs of water. Though the letter provided no instructions on how to comply. For Special Agent Patrick McGlennon, it did bring new encouragement just when all hope of recovering Mrs. Heron alive seemed lost. When we received the August 15th letter, which was in Mrs. Heron's handwriting, it really lifted the spirits of everybody that was involved in the case. We felt reasonably sure that she was in good enough condition to write the letter, and we were going to get her back the same way. The letter itself had been dated August 10th, 15 days after the abduction. Yet no one could be sure Mrs. Heron was alive on that date. It was unclear if she had written the letter on her own or if the message was coerced, according to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery. Certain words utilized on the letter seal me up in the cellar with jugs of water. In talking to family members, we found out that those are not words that she would normally utilize. She would have used the word basement or bottles of water. So it is our belief that the letter was dictated to her. If the letter had been dictated, both the message and the date could be false. Having to guess at what exactly he should do, Mr. Heron wrote checks to all the men listed in the original ransom note, according to U.S. Attorney James Tucker. He had already instructed his people to make efforts to determine what financial situations he had had with each of the people that were listed in the original note. So he had some idea at that particular point about how much money had been involved with, with each of those people. Mr. Heron settled on restitution, roughly equivalent to the amount the men had been ordered to pay in their franchise lawsuits. The total came to almost a million dollars. 
Heron sent $145,000 to the prime suspect, Alfred Wynn. Enclosed with each check was a note requesting the safe return of his wife. The FBI instructed the Postal Service to deliver the envelopes the next day. Later, agents spoke with Wynn's paralegal and learned of the attorney's reaction to Mr. Heron's check. When Mr. Wynn received his check in Tampa, Florida, he opened it, read the contents of the letter from Mr. Heron, turned to his paralegal and stated, this is not what I wanted. He told his paralegal that what he had wanted was to get his life back, the return of his confiscated car, jewelry, and other property. Wynn sent back the check with a note enclosed, saying he hoped Mrs. Heron would be returned safely. Agents now believe that Alfred Wynn had kidnapped Mrs. Heron for revenge against the photography company Heron once chaired, not for monetary gain. That meant it was less likely Mrs. Heron would ever be returned alive. Although some of the people receiving checks kept the money, most returned similar responses. Some of the people that Mr. Heron sent these checks to sent the checks immediately back to him, sent letters or called on the telephone, expressing their regret to Mr. Heron that something like this could happen to his wife. They wanted nothing to do with the money, and they weren't going to benefit through his grief. Two and a half months passed without further word from Annie Heron's kidnapper. Considering her fragile health, chances were slim she would survive this long. In early November 1988, the case was featured on a national crime-solving television series. Agents around the country chased each of hundreds of leads called in. One call from a woman in Florida seemed especially promising. Although none of the names on the ransom note had been broadcast, she said that if Alfred Wynn were on the list, she had important information. The FBI learned that the Florida woman was a spiritual advisor, which did not initially bolster confidence among agents. Uh, Special Agent Montgomery from the FBI. We spoke on the phone. But after a brief interview, they realized she had a strong reputation in the law enforcement field, having often assisted police in the past. The advisor told an agent she had first met N. Alfred Wynn four years earlier. In 1984, he had his first consultation, asking her advice about problems he had with the head of a photography company, the same company mentioned in the Heron Ransom note. She instructed him to pursue his problems through the court system and take legal means, and he told her that he had already done that, and it just didn't work. That's the big problem. That is the biggest Wynn problem. Wynn said he wanted to kidnap the head of the company and hold him hostage until he got what he wanted. He had the perfect place to put the man and said that he was looking for someone to help him. He called her a month and a half later to ask if she would help. She declined. The advisor provided the FBI with records of her work with Wynn. Once assured agents would protect her, she agreed to become a cooperating witness and promised to contact Wynn to arrange a meeting. FBI technicians would wire her office for sound and video. Our plan was to draw Mr. Wynn into a face-to-face -face meeting with her and to have them discuss their prior discussions of, of this kidnapping of Mr. Heron, as well as any of the other things that would verify exactly what he had said to her during their prior meetings. Alfred Wynn took the bait. Suspect the monitored meeting took place in early December 1988. FBI agents watched as Wynn approached the office. Agents hoped he would reveal the whereabouts of the missing woman. Heavenly Lord, 
The advisor told Wynn she had seen the crime show on television and asked if he had kidnapped Annie Heron. FBI one, can you hear him in there? Wynn denied it, adding that he had decided not to abduct Robert Heron as he had previously discussed with the advisor. The recording corroborated the advisor's statement, but it didn't provide agents with the evidence needed to arrest Alfred Wynn. When Wynn left the office, FBI agents followed him. We hoped a meeting between Mr. Wynn and the psychic would lead him to, at the very least, check on the location of Mrs. Heron's body or lead us to a co-conspirator. But the suspect never went to visit a place where the body could have been kept. Weeks later, agents learned that Wynn owned a cabin in Florida's swampland, a perfect place to hide a body. Dead or alive, agents hoped they'd find Annie Heron there. They had no way of knowing if the house was booby-trapped or if someone was armed and waiting inside. Six months after 73-year-old Annie Heron was kidnapped in Mississippi, FBI agents hoped to find her in a remote Florida cabin owned by prime suspect Alfred Wynn. The message from the kidnapper had threatened that the elderly woman would be sealed alive in a cellar. But agents found no cellar. The police was empty of anything related to the kidnapping. FBI Special Agent Patrick McLennan and other investigators continued searching for the kidnapped woman nearby. We began to look in dry cisterns, some swamp area adjacent to those properties, the outbuildings, screened porches, whatever structures existed. We found no sign of Mrs. Heron and no sign that anybody had ever stayed there for any length of time. Certainly no cellars. There were no cellars in that section of Florida. Annie Heron was still missing and presumed dead. Then, in late July of 1989, Alfred Wynn sent a filing cabinet to the IRS challenging them to find disputed financial documents. All right, guys, we got the file cabinet. We got the file cabinet from the IRS. Go ahead, move that over here. That's good. But he failed to check the cabinet thoroughly, and his arrogance would bring him down. When we believe, sent those thousands of documents to Internal Revenue Service as part of an effort to intimidate them, uh, into leaving him alone. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a pattern that the agents discovered in regard to when conduct in, in a number of situations. Uh, he, his arrogance was demonstrated in his efforts to overpower whoever he was involved with at any particular point. When they found letters regarding a kidnapping and murder plot, IRS agents called the FBI. The documents outlined how Wynn and a former girlfriend had been planning to kidnap and kill the woman's husband. According to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery, the similarities to Annie Heron's abduction were obvious. They mentioned utilizing an old typewriter to type a communication, and the first ransom note for Annie Laurie Heron was typed on an old 1920s vintage typewriter. They also mentioned detailed maps, uh, surveillance of the area. They also mentioned that it was actually Wynn that was gonna do the crime. And the female was just going to help him and obtain what he needed. FBI agents tracked down Wynn's ex-girlfriend at the community college where she worked. They needed to question her about the plot outlined in the letters. At first, she claimed she knew nothing about the plot. But when reminded that interfering with an investigation was itself a crime, she decided to cooperate. The last time you saw him was a few years ago? She said the plot to kill her husband was Wynn's idea. When she realized he was serious, she had broken up with Wynn. Agents asked if she had had any contact with him since then. She said that a year earlier, in early August 1988, Wynn had asked her to meet him at a motel in Deland, Florida. 
It was just days after Annie Heron had been kidnapped. Wynne acted paranoid, silently handing her a note that asked if her car was bugged and if she'd been followed. When he was convinced it was safe, he began talking. What's this all about? Wynne asked her to mail a letter for him, offering her $500 plus travel expenses. First of all, did I touch it? She agreed, and he paid her half in advance, $250. Wynne handed her an envelope wrapped in a gray linen napkin. Then he gave her very specific instructions. She was not to touch the envelope or even look at the address. Wynne ordered her to mail it from Atlanta, buy the airline tickets under a false name, and fly into and out of two different airports. He instructed her to change her appearance before the trip. She complied, changing her clothes, jewelry, and hair in the women's restroom at the airport. Once in Atlanta, she was to mail the envelope precisely on August 11th. But the woman told agents it was late in the day when she made it to a mailbox. At the last moment, she said she couldn't resist a glance at the address. The letter allegedly sent by Annie Laurie Heron was postmarked on August 12th from Atlanta. Have you seen this Agent photograph? showed the woman a photo of the envelope Robert Heron had received. She immediately recognized the distinctive handwriting. It was the envelope she had mailed. She said that she had thrown away the napkin used to carry the envelope on a rural road. She offered to take them there once she finished work. That evening, she brought the agents to the area. Investigators knew there was little chance they would find the napkin on the roadside after more than a year, but they looked anyway. They needed it to corroborate her story. Against all odds, they found it. But they wanted an admission in Alfred Wynne's own words. With a solid cooperating witness, agents were getting closer to arresting Wynne. At the FBI's request, Wynne's ex-girlfriend agreed to be wired for an audio tape meeting between herself and Wynne. We had hoped that Mr. Wynne would discuss facets of the crime, that he would tell her what she had accomplished by sending the letter to the Heron residence, that he would thank her for her help, that he would pay her. The woman called Wynne and set up a meeting. Agents had instructed her to try to draw Wynne out about the trip to Atlanta. As hoped, yep, Wynne gave his ex-girlfriend the $250 he still owed her for mailing the envelope. Wynne refused to talk in detail about his plan, and he never mentioned Annie Laurie Heron. He seemed to have stonewalled investigators again. Convinced he was involved and desperate to find Mrs. Heron, the FBI knew they had to arrest Wynne soon. On March 11, 1989, the FBI was ready to arrest suspected kidnapper Alfred Wynne. They set up a second meeting with Wynne's former girlfriend who had begun cooperating with authorities. The ex-girlfriend had been wired so agents could record the conversation. They hoped Wynne would say something incriminating about the kidnapping of Annie Heron so they could charge him and recover Mrs. Heron or her body. FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery had coached the informant on how to deal with Wynne in this crucial second meeting. We had instructed her to become more aggressive in this meeting 
and to basically indicate to him that she was aware that she was involved in, in a criminal act, that she'd been watching television, and that uh, she now realized that the letter that she mailed may in fact be in, involved in the kidnapping, may have been a second ransom note, hoping to elicit from him something to incriminate him further. Agents watched and listened as the woman pushed Wynn about the Heron kidnapping. The suspect soon became defensive and left the car without admitting any knowledge of the crime. Okay, he's falling out. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Agents knew it was time to make their move. The element of surprise is critical to a safe arrest. Alfred Wynn was charged with conspiracy to kidnap, mailing a threatening communication, and perjury for testifying in front of a grand jury that he wasn't involved in the kidnapping. But agents still had no solid proof that he or an accomplice had in fact abducted Annie Heron. In Wynn's car, agents discovered several maps of Mississippi, one with a Jackson exit marked on it in pen and notes in the margin. Agents thought these might indicate where Mrs. Heron's body had been placed, but extensive searches yielded nothing. Securing a warrant, Florida FBI agents searched Wynn's office. They needed physical evidence to prove Wynn was involved in the abduction of Annie Laurie Heron. Their hopes rose when they spotted a vintage typewriter. Special Agent McGlennon recalled that FBI examiners had determined the ransom note was typed on a 1920s era royal typewriter, the exact model recovered from Wynn's office. This seemed to be a very significant break. In my mind, this was the typewriter upon which Wynn typed the initial demand note that was left in the Heron's home. We sent it to the lab, fully expecting them to come back with a report saying, this is the, the exact typewriter that composed that letter. The FBI lab determined that the typewriter found in Wynn's office was not the one used to type the ransom note. Agents believed Wynn had planted a different typewriter to bring doubt to later prosecution. They had also found a business card for a van rental company in Wynn's office. How you doing? The company manager, owner said FBI, Alfred Wynn had rented white vans uh, three times. Uh, I'm the manager. Okay. Each time he had driven more than 500 miles, uh, yes, just 100 miles more than the round trip to the Heron's uh, residence. Yes, I do, but I don't have a the rental times did not coincide with the date of the abduction but one did match Alfred? the date when Alfred Wynn was sighted in the Heron's neighborhood. Hey, U.S. Attorney James Tucker had little evidence to prove his case. He believed that Wynn and his paralegal were lying about the suspect being with a prostitute on the day of the kidnapping. We went back and confronted the paralegal with this false alibi. The agents and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him, at which he decided that he better tell us that all that was a lie and that, uh, and that uh, Mr. Wynn had, in fact, been out of his law offices and out of pocket during the entire time that, uh, that the abduction occurred, which would have been the crucial dates, the 24th through about the 28th. This would help prove perjury, but it wasn't enough to charge Wynn with the crime they were certain he had committed, the kidnapping and murder of Annie Laurie Heron. The federal trial for conspiracy to kidnap began in Mississippi on January 29, 1990. Throughout the investigation and the two-week trial which occurred in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Wynn professed his innocence. But at the conclusion, a jury of his peers found him guilty for the crimes for which he was charged. N. Alfred Wynn received the maximum sentence allowed, 19 years and seven months for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. 
he has no chance of parole from the federal prison in Coleman, Florida. We have never to this day resolved where Mrs. Heron is now. And the family deserves to know that. In fact, as far as this office is concerned, we still carry this as an open matter and will continue to do so until such time as uh, somebody steps forward and uh, helps us out with locating where Mrs. Heron is. Family deserves it. Mr. Robert Heron died of a heart attack on November 28, 1990. In May of 1991, Mrs. Annie Laurie Heron was declared dead to allow the settlement of the couple's estate. The Heron family still hopes to someday learn what happened to their mother, to begin to heal their pain, and to finally lay her to rest. In Arizona, a shipment of money vanished into the high desert along with the two men hired to guard it. The FBI didn't know if the guards were participants or victims of an ambush. Answers lay somewhere in Arizona's vast Northwest Territory. FBI agents struggled to piece together scattered clues to reveal the truth. In Arizona, an armored van loaded with cash failed to reach its destination. Authorities suspected an inside job. When the vehicle was recovered, with the drivers and the cash missing, those suspicions grew even more. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. This well-planned crime required extraordinary efforts to solve. The FBI knew that the smallest detail could make or break the case. May 24th, 1977, Phoenix, Arizona. A security company transferred $333,000 in cash and coins from their vault to an armored van. Two courier guards prepared for another day distributing cash to Arizona banks. Y'all about ready to go? We've got a problem with this door. I think if you want to take a look at it, let me see. One guard discovered a problem with the van's side door latch. They would report to the company maintenance garage before they set out. This delay put Cecil Newkirk and Russell Dempsey an hour behind schedule. The day's route included stops from Phoenix, 150 miles north to Flagstaff. Base, uh, With the delay, it would be difficult to make all the stops. Banks waited on the deliveries to provide cash to their customers. Your latest security. By 10.30 a.m., the security uh -huh. company received a call from a bank complaining well, we the, they had not received yeah, their had delivery. At first, the dispatcher thought the late start explained right. the problem. Right, we'll keep us right. But throughout the afternoon, the dispatcher couldn't reach the guards. Base courier one. Dempsey, you out there? This is base. Come on in. By 4.30, the company contacted the FBI. The Phoenix field office broadcast an APB for the armored van to all area police. State and local authorities used the remaining light of the evening to search for the missing van. They found no sign of it or the courier guards. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth, now retired from the FBI's Phoenix field office, wondered if the guards had driven off with the money. 
one of the first things that you do is certainly look at the drivers to see whether or not that might be a possibility as to what had happened, whether there's a driver involvement. Both of the missing guards were married. That evening, an FBI agent interviewed each of their wives separately. They confirmed that neither of their husbands had financial problems that would provoke them to steal the money. Company officials agreed. Both guards had given 20 years of faithful service. The missing van's route covered a vast area of the state. Authorities had nearly a thousand square miles to search, and most of that terrain was remote desert. The next day, Arizona Department of Public Safety helicopters retraced the guard's scheduled route. They flew up Interstate 17, north toward Flagstaff, checking all exits. Pilots spotted the van 50 miles north of Phoenix. It had been abandoned a quarter mile off the interstate in a remote area near the town of Bumblebee. Arizona public safety officers and local deputies cordoned off the area before the FBI arrived. Agents approached the van cautiously. They did not want to disturb the footprints tracked around the vehicle. The armored van's doors were locked. From the outside, there was little to indicate what had occurred. There didn't appear to be a struggle on the inside, but we had to actually get inside the vehicle before we could really conduct a thorough investigation or examination of the van. And it wasn't until later on that morning that they had brought a spare set of keys out and we effected entry into the van. The radio was still on. Yet the base had not received any calls for help. The van's siren had not been tripped. A shotgun kept in the van for defense had not been fired, and its safety was still engaged. The guards had not used any of their resources to signal that there had been a robbery. In the back, agents found bags containing several thousand dollars in coins, but $293,000 in paper currency was missing. Blood spatter on the carpet and money bags indicated someone had been injured, but agents didn't know who. Your biggest fear at the time, of course, is, uh, is for the safety of the guards. Uh, money can always, always be replaced, your life cannot. And so we were uh, certainly concerned about the guards' fate. Amongst the footprints in the dust, investigators noted a separate set of tire tracks behind the van. Evidence technicians captured the tire prints with photos and plaster casts. Agents concluded that it was unlikely the guards had been overpowered by a single perpetrator. The location of the van, uh, the condition of the van, and everything that we found at the scene uh, just told us that uh, this was a crime that had been well planned and probably had been committed by more than one person. There. Deputy Dale Lent from nearby Mojave County was brought in to assist the investigation. A narcotics officer trained in ground print identification, Lent could reconstruct crimes from foot and vehicle prints. He was one of only two trackers qualified to testify in Arizona court. The first concern was to check the area to see if the guards had been taken somewhere away from the van and, and something had happened to them. So, uh, the first thing I did was do a 360 around the scene, uh, which included checking uh, the road further up. The guards were nowhere to be found. But on a hill near where the van was abandoned, Lent discovered more tire tracks and footprints. 
From this position, there was an unobstructed view of the interstate that the guards traveled. Back near the van itself, the deputy found two separate sets of large footprints. Based on his observations, Lent concluded that at least one other vehicle and two perpetrators had been involved. The vehicle had come down, backed up near the van, picked up something up, whether it be the two guards or whether it be uh, the money, hard to tell. But I, I'd say it was the money because it was a trail. It wasn't just one. It was a well beat out path. Examining the strata of tread prints, Lent deduced that one vehicle had followed the van from the interstate to where it was abandoned. Deeper tracks leading back into the interstate showed that the vehicle had left much heavier than when it came. Investigators believed that dead or alive, the guards had been taken by the assailants. The FBI turned to the media for help. We did what we could to keep this on the front page of the news, and we did what we could to make sure that people were aware that we were looking for uh, these guards. The media reports generated calls from witnesses. Several motorists claimed to have seen the van stopped on the northbound side of Interstate 17 on the morning of May 24th. One saw an Arizona Department of Public Safety officer walking towards the van. Other witnesses had similar stories, but details differed. The make and color of the officer's car varied. In some accounts, he was parked in front of the van. Other times, he was stopped behind. Agents contacted the Arizona Department of Public Safety. No officers had reported stopping an armored van on I-17 that morning. Well, at that point, um, I was fairly convinced that uh, something uh, amiss had probably happened to the guards, that uh, somehow, someplace, they had been stopped, and um, they had let their guard down, and uh, that they'd been taken captive. And um, being that we didn't find uh, the guards uh, in the immediate vicinity, it uh, soon became evident that the guards probably were taken uh, against their will. The FBI and Deputy Lent searched Interstate 17 for the spot witnesses had described. The tracker found the place where he believed the van had been stopped. The marks were fresh within the time frame, 24 to 48 hours. You could see where the door was, where somebody got out, where there were scuff marks there on the ground. It looked like, you know, where there'd been movement. Digs and gouges in the dirt indicated that there had been a struggle near the rear of the van. A second vehicle's tire tracks at the interstate matched those in the remote area where the van had been abandoned. Curiously, the same tracks were found further up the road, just in front of where the van had been pulled over. Several motorists even underwent hypnosis to provide details to a sketch artist of what they remembered. Some recalled that the officer at the scene wore a hat. Others claimed the officer had no hat. But none of the sketches produced any leads. The FBI had reached a dead end. Then, on the morning of June 16, 1977, 300 miles northwest of where the van had been abandoned, two men made a gruesome discovery while fishing at Lake Mead. The men discovered a body floating in Debbie's Cove. They contacted the National Park Service. Investigators sped to the cove where the body had been spotted. Local law enforcement joined the National Park Service divers. They pulled close to the corpse. The body was fully clothed. Its 
head and torso were covered with a canvas bag. An officer retrieved a wallet from the back pocket. The victim was Russell Dempsey, one of the missing armored car guards. The divers searched the area, but couldn't find the second guard's body. Not far below the surface, they discovered two sticks of wood connected by a rope. Hey guys. What do you got? Okay, bring it on over to the boat here. To investigators, it appeared to be a garage used to strangle someone. The robbery was now a murder investigation. Investigators still had nothing that could lead them to any suspects. They only knew that an Arizona public safety officer, or someone masquerading as one, might be involved. On the morning of June 16, 1977, National Park Service divers in Arizona retrieved a dead body from Lake Mead. It was one of two armored car guards that had disappeared on May 24th, along with $293,000. The whereabouts of the second guard and the money remained unknown. The county medical examiner determined that the guard found in the lake had suffered a heart attack. He had also been strangled. Investigators believed that a garrote recovered near the body had been used to choke him. A strand of the victim's hair found tangled in the device supported their suspicions. FBI agents traveled to Lake Mead to question people who were familiar with the resort area. Whoever had dumped the body had likely used a boat to get to the deeper water. More than 20 agents canvassed rental shops around the 247 square mile lake. No one reported any suspicious activity, but agents collected rental receipts in the hopes they'd eventually have a suspect's name to reference. Special Agent Laird Heastand, now retired from the FBI's Kingman Resident Agency, joined the case. He would search for names on receipts any place a traveler might have visited in the area. We didn't have any good leads on who had committed this crime. And our assistant uh, agent in charge in the Phoenix office decided to have FBI agents check every service station from the area where the armored car was located all the way up to Lake Mead where the body had been transported. That was a distance of more than 300 miles. Considering all the different routes to the lake, the agents had hundreds of service stations to check. The agent started his inquiries at the station owned by an acquaintance named Stan. I asked Stan if he had heard anything about the robbery, and he said to me, I've been waiting for somebody to come to talk to me. And then he related to me that the day after the robbery that he had to take his tow truck up to uh, Lake Mead and uh, pull a truck out of the lake that had backed out into the lake. On May 25th, Stan had received a call from two men whose truck was stuck at Benelli Landing on the lake. The men explained they had gotten drunk while fishing and backed their truck too close to the water. The owner didn't see any fishing equipment in the pickup, but he did notice drag marks in the dust of the flatbed. It appeared that something heavy had been hauled out of the back. All right. Stan brought the two men to his service station. He wrote a receipt and asked for a signature. 
The customers hesitated before one agreed to sign. The name he used was Mike Poland. The station owner believed he'd be able to identify the men if he saw them again. It was the break investigators had been hoping for. The ease by which he found it surprised Special Agent Heestand. The first place I walk into, I develop this information. It, it totally caught me off guard and, and shocked me. And I said, oh, boy, this is it. We, we finally, we have something that uh, we can start from. Agents searched for the name Michael Poland amongst the thousands of boat rental receipts collected from Lake Mead. After several hours, they found it. Michael Poland had rented a boat the day after the robbery, naming Benelli Landing as his destination. It was the same spot from where his truck had been towed. Agents returned to Lake Mead, searching for additional evidence between Benelli Landing and the boat rental shop on the opposite shore. Within the breadth of that four and a half mile span, Officers spotted another bag-covered corpse floating on the surface. It was the second missing courier guard. He had been severely beaten before he was drowned. The medical examiner found two welts on his chest, consistent with wounds inflicted by a high-voltage taser gun. The guard's personal effects were removed, including a self-winding watch that had stopped at 10.37 p.m. on May 26th. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth's team redoubled their search for clues at Lake Mead. Based upon where their bodies were found and the currents and the length of time that we felt that they had been in the water itself, we were able to track back where we thought they may have been put in um, at Lake Mead. That area was just 100 yards from Debbie's Cove, where the body of the first guard had surfaced. Divers focused on a ledge 12 feet down that bordered an 800-foot trench. A sweep of the ledge yielded a third canvas bag, similar to the ones that covered the bodies. The bag was sent to the FBI lab for processing. Inside the bag, agents recovered an Arizona license plate that resembled those used on Arizona public safety cruisers. Two revolvers were also found, but no prints could be lifted from the corroded weapons. Rocks that matched those from Benelli Landing had held the bag at the bottom. Examiners also found concrete dust caked in the weave of the canvas bag. Agents called on Stan, hoping the service station owner could identify a driver's license photo of Michael Poland. One of the two men that had hired him to tow their pickup from Benelli Landing. Among six photos, Stan recognized the face of Michael Poland. The FBI had finally confirmed a primary suspect. They hoped Michael Poland would lead them to another. In June of 1977, the FBI pursued whoever killed two armored car guards and made off with $293,000. Tire tracks and footprints at the crime scene suggested that at least two perpetrators were involved. Agents believed one of them was Michael Poland. They hoped surveillance of Poland would lead to another. Though he did not appear to have a job, Poland was spending a lot of money. Agents saw a new motorcycle on the property. The FBI identified a man who visited frequently as Michael's younger brother, Patrick. Patrick Poland had just bought a new car. When the brothers were inside, 
an agent approached Michael's teenage son and complimented the new motorcycle. The boy responded that his father had recently bought two of them and a lot more. Agents expanded their investigation to include Patrick Poland and subpoenaed the financial records of both brothers. Prior to the armored van robbery, each had severe money problems. Shortly after, their debts had been paid and both had purchased new vehicles. Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth compared their income to their recent spending habits. We tried to document as much as we could as to how much money they were spending and to uh, what kind of means of support that they had. And the two just didn't seem to mesh very well. And uh, when that happens, and then you know that folks have got uh, access to uh, a fairly large amount of money with no real means of support, uh, that's a pretty good clue to us. Agents interviewed the brother's father and photographed his pickup truck. Mr. Poland admitted that his sons had borrowed the truck on the day of the robbery. The father had mixed concrete in the flatbed several weeks before the robbery. Agents took a sample of the dust for processing. FBI examiners analyzed the concrete sample. They compared it to the cement dust on the canvas bags recovered from Lake Mead. Examiners concluded that the dust on the bag had come from the same batch of concrete taken from the truck. Once again, the FBI asked Stan to look at a photo lineup. The station owner could not identify Patrick Poland as the man with Michael. But he did recognize their father's truck as the one he towed from the lake. Positively. In the early morning of July 27, 1977, agents arrived at Michael Poland's house with a search warrant. Poland claimed to be a self-employed jewelry salesman. He said that on the day of the heist, he was in Las Vegas buying gems. Investigators found $12,000 in cash. He claimed it was used for their jewelry business. The agents confiscated numerous receipts. One of them was for a pair of high-voltage taser guns sold to a man named Mark Harris a month before the robbery. A short distance away, agents searched the house of Michael's brother, Patrick Poland. FBI Special Agent Frank Mowry, now retired, asked if he and his brother Michael had been at Lake Mead. Patrick gave a different story than his brother had. He initially said that he and his brother were there fishing. He was very nervous. He was extremely nervous. He had difficulty in explaining a lot of um, about his whereabouts, particularly on the day of the crime and the day after the crime. While Patrick was being interviewed, he received a call. It was his brother, Michael. Yeah, they're over here, too. He urged Patrick not to talk to investigators. The search at Patrick's house yielded a stash of weapons and $16,000 in cash. The FBI tracked down and processed the cars the brothers owned before the robbery. The tire treads did not match the tracks found at the crime scene. Examiners found no physical evidence that tied the cars to the crime. Agents visited the gun store where the tasers had been sold to Mark Harris prior to the robbery. The clerk who had made the sale could only remember that Harris was a white male in his 20s. Since the receipt was found in Michael Poland's home, they theorized it was probably his alias. 
One of the things the FBI does is try to eliminate all other good logical suspects, and we did this in that case. The name Mark Harris, a rather common name, we had to eliminate that name as being uh, anybody other than the alias of Mike Poland. Special Agent Mao researched public records for a Mark Harris between the ages of 25 and 40. We actually identified literally hundreds of Mark Harris's from uh, vehicle records, uh, motor vehicle records, uh, phone books, and every way we could, and went out to their houses physically, tracked them down and interviewed them, and uh, found that they did not have anything to do with this crime. With no proof that Mark Harris was an alias for Michael Poland, and no physical evidence tying the brothers to the crimes, agents couldn't arrest the brothers. For the next 10 months, all agents could do was keep careful track of their movements. Special Agent Chenoweth flew helicopter surveillance. We wanted to know everything that Michael and Patrick Poland did, uh, what they had done in the past, what they were going to do in the future. Investigators continued to document the brothers' spending habits. They watched as the Polans closed a deal on a gaming arcade. Despite the circumstantial evidence, agents were unable to make an arrest. The FBI had to find stronger physical evidence to prevent the Poland brothers from getting away with murder. In April of 1978, the FBI suspected Michael and Patrick Poland of killing two courier guards and stealing nearly $300,000. After 11 months of investigation, agents did not have enough to convince a grand jury to indict. FBI Special Agent Frank Mowry desperately searched for evidence that would strengthen the case. What we badly needed was physical evidence. We didn't have fingerprints. We didn't have any real good eyewitnesses. We didn't have any physical bits of uh, evidence that could leak Mike and Pat Poland to the crime. The agent focused on the three canvas bags retrieved from Lake Mead with the guards' bodies. He checked with over 20 sources in the Phoenix area where the bags might have been manufactured. None recognized the work. Nobody could even give me a hint of who in town would make such a bag. Uh, some even said, well, they probably came from out of town. So I became very discouraged. The agent visited the last store on his list and showed the bag. The owner recognized it as coming from his company. It was a custom size with a unique stitch sewn only by their seamstresses. He also identified the specially ordered cord purchased from a Georgia company. As far as the owner knew, his was the only shop in the area that made anything like it. He said, I will have in my record somewhere a receipt, because somebody would have walked in that door there and they would have said, uh, I need to order so many bags, a certain length, a certain width, certain specifications. At the Phoenix FBI office, agents poured over hundreds of receipts covering years of business from the bag manufacturer. After almost a week, they found one receipt for three custom canvas bags dated one month before the robbery. They were sold to a man named Mark Harris. Agents had seen the name before on a receipt for a pair of tasers. They had found the voucher months earlier during a search of Michael Poland's house. The FBI was further convinced that Mark Harris was an alias for Michael Poland. The canvas bag receipt connected the alias to the murdered guards, and cement dust in the pickup the brothers drove matched dust found in the bags. On May 17, 1978, after nearly a year of investigation, a federal grand jury returned an indictment for murder, kidnapping, and robbery against Michael and Patrick Poland. The FBI suspected that the Polands would not surrender quietly. They've both already killed two men that we know of. You've got your Ralph plan. You're going to be picking up Patrick. We're going to be picking up Mike. Check your weapons. Check your vests. 
Special Agent Stephen Chenoweth believed an armed confrontation was possible. It had to be very well and meticulously planned. Uh, the Polans were very violent. They had shown their violence. They had a strong propensity to uh, you know, commit violence as evidenced by uh, the guards' fate. And one of the things that we absolutely knew we could not do was to arrest them while they were in the, in the house. And um, we absolutely had to take them away from the homes. Agents feared the suspects would barricade themselves in their houses and shoot it out if they discovered they were going to be arrested. This guy, yeah. Agents waited for Patrick Poland to emerge. Yep. When he finally did, they noticed he was carrying a case for a handgun. tailed him for a safe place to make the arrest. The second arrest team waited for Michael Poland to come out of a real estate office. Once outside, there would be less risk to bystanders if shooting erupted. The first arrest team caught up with Patrick outside the game arcade. The agents intercepted him before he entered the building. We identified ourselves. Of course, he knew me already from previous contacts, and I told him the time had come, and uh, we had warrants for their arrest, and he gave up without um, any, um, any problem. Uh, he was armed. He had a 44 Magnum weapon on him and another couple of weapons in his car, but he made no effort to use them. Agents radioed the other team that Patrick had been picked up. Michael Poland had been in the real estate office for almost 45 minutes. Agents feared that he had somehow gotten word of Patrick's arrest and was preparing for an armed confrontation. They decided to risk entering the building. Federal agents, please step back. The suspected murderer surrendered without incident. Michael Poland refused to answer questions. He insisted his brother do the same. No fingerprints tied either brother to the murdered guards or the abducted van. Michael remained confident that the FBI case was weak. When a case like this, you've got uh, a joint venue. Uh, venue certainly lies with uh, the federal government with respect to the actual robbery of the van. And, um, but we also have a homicide case that rests with the state authorities. Authorities considered their best strategy for a successful prosecution. State and federal prosecutors decided to split the charges. The Polans went on trial for robbery and kidnapping in federal court. Based on the circumstantial evidence gathered, a federal jury found the brothers guilty of the charges on February 15, 1979. They were sentenced to 100 years. These were two guards that were very hardworking, very loyal to their company. Both of them had worked for about 20 years for the company. They were actually within weeks of retiring. They were family men. They were good men, uh, religious men, men that um, had uh, devoted a lot of time and effort and loyalty to this company. And on the eve of their retirement, uh, they were killed. In November of 1979, an Arizona state jury returned a guilty verdict for murder. The judge gave the brothers the death penalty. The Polans appealed their conviction. 
The Arizona Supreme Court found that the testimony of a hypnotized witness and the taser gun evidence should not have been used. They also found that the jury had inappropriately discussed the federal trial. The Poland brothers' state murder convictions were overturned. Though agents were certain that the brothers had brutally murdered two men, state prosecutors would not seek a new trial. Because of parole laws at the time, Michael and Patrick Poland would be eligible for parole in less than seven years. In 1982, an Arizona prosecutor declined to retry Michael and Patrick Poland for murder. We tried, but we chose not to because was the exclusion of the eyewitness testimony. He cited the cost, as well as the difficulty of proving the case with the evidence that had been excluded by the Arizona Supreme Court. United States attorney Melvin McDonald was outraged that the Poland brothers might get away with murder. I had followed it uh, by way of the media and but never dreamed that I would play any role in the case until 1982 when it became clear that the ball was going to get dropped unless somebody stopped in. I called the county attorney and volunteered to take the case. For the first time in history, a U.S. attorney was deputized as an Arizona state prosecutor. McDonald had to resurrect a case that many considered impossible to retry. There had been uh, five years transpired between the time of the crime and the time of the trial. Witnesses travel and move all over the country. Memories start to fade. And so you've got to recreate and present the crime as if it happened a month ago when you're facing the problem that it's really five years old. The prosecutor wanted to lock down the exact time that the victims had been deposited into Lake Mead and prove it was the same time the Polands were at the lake, so there would be no question the Polands were responsible. One of the problems with the finding of the guards was that their bodies were not recovered for six weeks. Uh, the defense, we knew, would argue uh, that they could have been dumped there by the real killers at any time. Working with the FBI, the prosecutor found a piece of evidence that had been overlooked in the earlier trials. The second guard's self-winding watch. Examiners noted that the watch stopped at 10.37 p.m. on May 26th. That particular self-winding watch would stop working if it weren't moved for 12 hours. That meant that the guard's watch stopped 12 hours after his arm came to rest at the bottom of Lake Mead. We actually had watch experts take the watch apart to prove that the watch had not stopped because of water damage. There was no water that had gotten into the uh, in, uh, portions of the watch that controlled its operation. We literally went all the way to Switzerland to get experts there to talk about how much time it would take for a watch that hadn't, be cleared in, hadn't been cleaned in five years to finally unwind. Watch to the jury, please. Forensics experts used this information to Ladies determine gentlemen. exactly when the bodies had been dumped into the water. When the Their estimation exactly matched the time the FBI had established that the Polands were at the lake getting their pickup towed from Benelli Landing. The prosecutor explained that the brothers had been there to dump the bodies. For the drama point, I told the jury that while Mr. Newkirk is dead, he is speaking to you from the grave. He's asking you, look at my watch. I'm sending you a message through my watch. After three hours of deliberation, the jury was convinced. Will the defendants rise? On November 18, 1982, they found Michael and Patrick Poland guilty of murder. The judge reinstated Court the adjourned. sentence of death. All rise. Once again, the defendants appealed the conviction. It was one of the rare instances where their case went to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States, in a published opinion, a very closely divided court, again affirmed their conviction and sentences. How the situation... With nothing left to lose, Patrick Poland agreed to tell investigators and the families of the victims exactly what happened.
1987, he gave his confession to FBI Special Agent Frank Mowry. They had actually spent almost a year tailing the van. They knew its route on those mornings that it went up to Prescott and delivered its money to the banks in Prescott. They knew the exact route. They knew the stops that it made. They knew the times that it did it. They knew everything about it. The Polans used neither of their own cars in the robbery. They had rented one with cash that the FBI was unable to trace. We never found it. It was a rental car. And by the time the rental car was taken back, it was by the time they figured out what was going on, it had been rented out probably 200 times since then. And we were never able to actually pin down for certainty the car that may have been used in the case. The brothers affixed a light bar and a license plate that resembled those used by the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Batteries for you for that, CB? I believe so. They readied their tools needed for the heist. The Polans waited more than an hour. The van was unexpectedly delayed. Finally, they saw their quarry. Patrick drove the disguised car while Michael hid under the dash. They stopped the van on the pretext of speeding. Company policy insisted that the guards never open the van doors to anyone, even if stopped by the police. Patrick ordered the driver to step out. When he failed to follow procedure, the driver and his partner were defenseless. Poland's put the guards in the rear of the van. Michael was to drive the van while Patrick drove the car. But when Patrick took off, the van didn't follow. This explained the tracks found in front of where the van was stopped. By the time Patrick reached the rear of the van, Michael was beating the guards. They stunned the guards with high voltage tasers. The brothers drove the vehicles into the desert near the town of Bumblebee. Fat. One of the guards looked as if he had died from the beating. Michael decided that the other would have to die as well. He had a makeshift garrote in his pocket, a cord tied to two pieces of wood. And the one thing we found out about it, of course, is that Mike was obviously the, um, the planner, the instigator, and the enforcer and everything related to the crime, and that he was the one who physically murdered the two guards. Uh, Pat, of course, helped him at uh, Mike's insistence, but it was uh, Mike who put the rope around their neck and choked them. Went around the back. Patrick claimed that Michael had buried most of the money in the desert. Just had to stop. At least one of the Poland's relatives knew where that was. Because she cooperated, the authorities didn't prosecute her for her involvement. The money had rotted from the elements in the intervening years. Patrick's confession gave closure to the case. We knew most of it. 
we felt better, of course, when the person actually admits it because there's always some room for doubt until you get it from the, the heart and from the mouth of the perpetrator. The courts turned down all appeals for the Polans. The state of Arizona finally administered a lethal injection to Michael Poland on June 16, 1999. After all calls for clemency were denied, Patrick Poland was executed nine months later on March 15, 2000. Unlike his older brother, Patrick used his final moments to express regret for the pain and suffering he had caused.